for today's episode, it's going to be a little spooky. Yeah! I love spooky. Oh, do you? Do you really love spooky? In a survey by Kids Health, the number one fear kids have is scary movies and TV shows, with war and terrorism a distant fourth. Despite this, it's not at all uncommon to find a kid who's really into horror. It's usually kid-friendly horror, but plenty of kids will beg their parents to watch the good shit, that rated R shit. Take this post from a parenting subreddit. My youngest son is fascinated with scary characters. He goes around singing the 1-2 Freddy's Coming For You song around the house and will ask about the killers when the mood strikes. Mother, how are the killers? Children taking an interest in scary stuff generally makes their parents a little concerned, partially because the kids might end up accidentally going too far and having nightmares. Like me, all the time. I was a terrified child. I called my parents to pick me up from about half the sleepovers I went to. But as easily spooked as I was, I still seeked out scary stuff. The first horror adjacent thing I was into to start chronologically in full baby mode was probably Scooby-Doo. Those old episodes are not gonna scare anyone, and not just because they inexplicably, psychotically have a laugh track across the whole thing, but also because the gang caught the monster every time, then ripped his mask off to reveal that he was actually just the mean old town pervert all along. But when I was five years old, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island dropped. I only saw that movie once, around when it first aired, but I've remembered it my entire life, because the monsters in it were actually real. And they discover that by Fred trying to unmask a zombie and instead pulling its head clean off. It's still goofy and goreless, but that was about the most metal thing my young eyes had ever seen. I also fell in love with Courage the Cowardly Dog, which started airing when I was six years old in 1999. Watching that show now, it's way more often trying to be funny than trying to be scary. But I kind of forgot that because those effectively creepy villains are what stuck with me the past 22 years. Fred the Barber, Return the Slab Guy, and it was one of those cartoons where nothing is canon, so instead of resolving neatly like most kids' shows, it would sometimes leave things in an unsettling place. Like in The Great Fusilli, Eustace and Muriel get turned into puppets and Courage never gets to turn them back. The episode ends with him puppeteering them through a classic family moment, and that was a season finale. This was also the age I got deeply into the Goosebumps books, of which there were countless classics. Of course, there's Night of the Living Dummy, which was the world's introduction to the talking ventriloquist dummy Slappy, who's pretty much the mascot of the franchise today. But Say Cheese and Die was the one I reread the most for some reason. It was about a camera that, when used to take a picture of someone, would print a little Polaroid showing something scary happening to them, and then later, that thing would come true. Like this. Cheese and die. Uh-oh. But the first scary thing I remember keeping me up all night was an Are You Afraid of the Dark episode called The Tale of the Ghastly Grinner. The Ghastly Grinner is a comic book that our young hero gets wet, microwaves to dry off, and in doing so accidentally brings the creepy jester from the comic to life. Pretty stupid setup. But then the gesture starts turning people into hysterical, cackling zombies that drool a gross blue goo. The scene where they discover the bus driver's been turned is still pretty creepy to me. The Grinner stuck with young me to the point where I had recurring nightmares about him, laughing at me with that weird blue drool. I once slept over at my grandpa's house in a big walk-in closet with my cousins, cuddling my favorite stuffed tiger. And sure enough, when I slept, I had another nightmare about the Grinner. This time he found me and gleefully took my tiger away. And then when I woke up, the tiger was actually gone. My family and I tore the place apart looking for it, but I never saw it again. Jesus, what the hell was that? At age seven, I watched the very much not horror Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade at a friend's house, and it still scared my short pants off. There's a scene when they arrive at the trap-filled temple and a dude in front of them goes inside and the temple spits his head out. That scene gave me this weird, pretty long-term phobia of severed heads. I remember specifically looking out my bedroom window and just being unable to stop picturing a severed head flying at me and slamming into the glass. Looking back on that fear, I stand by it. That'd be scary. Maybe the first actual horror movie I ever saw was Poltergeist. And I don't know who let me see that when I was single digit years old, but I blame them for everything. The face peeling hallucination is what did it for me. The effects are pretty goofy in hindsight, but to my young mind, this was a scientifically accurate video of someone tearing their own face off. 
And I felt crazy for being so bothered by it. I mean, after all, it was rated PG, and it didn't seem to stick with my friends or anything. CinemaSins didn't even count its over-the-top gruesomeness as a sin. Scene does not contain a lap dance. Going out to rent a movie with my mom, I remember getting nightmares just from the cover of the Leprechaun VHS. The imagination ran wild. If the Leprechaun wanted me dead, what could I do about it? And back in those days, there was no wiki I could just pull up and find out his weaknesses of four-leaf clover and wrought iron and stealing his gold and being simply blown apart without the use of any specific method and they can also get stepped on. There are also some Treehouse of Horror episodes that definitely surprised me and creeped me out. There's something about the itchy and scratchy level violence brought into the regular, upbeat Simpsons world that unnerved me especially in the season 12 story where dolphins took over the planet. It was that moment where Willie gets impaled by a dolphin, which was clearly supposed to be funny, but was nothing to my child mind but a terrifying image. And as someone who stands next to a window all the time, a little too close to home. Then of course, there was scary stories to tell in the dark. These illustrations are a cultural touchstone, probably the most widely appreciated of any of these examples. It's like a big shared trauma across multiple generations of kids. But we're not pissed off about it. That shit was sick. The American Library Association listed these books as the most challenged of the 1990s, meaning it was the series that the most concerned parents tried to get banned from the library. Way above Harry Potter. And J.K. Rowling, you know, turned out to be a turf. And so which one's more problematic? And you know, I'm not even not talking about Trelawney exclusionary reactionary feminists. <laughs> Perhaps in response to this, the 30th anniversary of the books in 2011 came with new, less day-ruining illustrations from a different artist. And this article complaining about the tamer art sums up what was magic about the originals perfectly. These books to a kid felt like forbidden objects, things you weren't supposed to have. Because I do have a crystal clear memory of holding scary stories to tell in the dark in my hands at my school library in disbelief that it was allowed, and clocking each illustration as I flipped through going, yep, gonna have a nightmare about that. Definitely a nightmare. Oh, that's gonna be a rough one. When I was around 10 years old, at a friend's house, I accidentally saw his dad watching a behind the scenes clip from some movie where a zombie pops out of a trash can. And I've thought about it every time I've taken the trash out since. No one on Twitter knew what it was. I can't find anything that matches the description online outside of Plants vs. Zombies. Does anyone watching know what I'm talking about? Did I just make that up? Is any of this real? At that tender age of 10, I still tried to avoid most real horror because it affected me so much. But there was a sweet spot of horror that I really loved and continued to pursue, which at the time I found in that Pirates of the Caribbean scene with the skeletons walking underwater. That scene blew me away and elevated the rest of the movie so much. Now if you're at all squeamish in the face of evil, brace yourself for this next twisted tale of terror. At a sleepover, my friends and I watched Scary Movie 2, and I got so scared that after the first 15 minutes, I lied and said I was tired and went to bed early. And then three hours later, after everyone else went to sleep, I called my dad to come pick me up. Watching that intro scene now, god damn it is so stupid. And it's hard to believe it ruined my night like it did. And this one was embarrassingly late too. Like doing the math on who I was hanging out with and when, I couldn't have been younger than 13. But I was an easily terrified little man and I was constantly overstepping what I was capable of consuming, sometimes intentionally. I loved scary books at that age, both young horror like Cirque du Freak and adult horror like The Shining, but the really fucked up stuff was in this young adult horror series called Demonata, where in the first chapter of the first book, the protagonist comes home to find his mom, dad, and sister dead with their bodies horrifically mutilated. I read it jaw agape, then laid there in my bed and couldn't fall asleep, and then I did it again the next night. So why did I dance with the devil? Why did I continuously risk weeks of recurring nightmares and making myself even more scared of the dark than I already was just for the thrill of that one perfect goosebump? There are lots of possible reasons why kids get obsessed with horror, whether overtly and excitedly like that girl who loves spooky, or just out of morbid curiosity they're half in denial about, like yours truly. Some horror, like Chucky, just has appealing iconography for kids. I certainly knew who Chucky was far before I was brave enough to ever watch a movie he was in. Five Nights at Freddy's has a bit of this going on as well. It's got the attention-grabbing characters and jump scares that make for good dares between friends, but also the deep, eerie lore that I could totally see myself deep diving on late at night. 
And of course, Slappy, that dummy who lived that one night in Goosebumps, is huge with kids, thanks to the new movies. Countless kids' YouTube channels have content where they just get a Slappy doll and I don't even know what. Yell at him, pretend he's doing stuff. Oh my goodness, did you put oh, Lola in the cage? Did you put oh, her in the cage? He did it. Who did? He did it. Look, he's looking at us over there. Slappy, what the fuck, man? Slappy and Goosebumps in general is an example of some really approachable children's horror, which I have all the respect in the world for. All the most memorable, impactful fiction I consumed as a kid was the stuff with actual stakes. This creepy monster is going to kill you, and even if he doesn't, he's still gonna scare you real bad. I think kids can tell when they're being talked down to whether they have the exact words to explain that or not. And horror, even kids' horror, always felt mature to me. Something new I hadn't seen before that was outside of my safe zone, where I didn't know what to expect. But enough about kids and their perspective. What about the people whose groins make kids? Parents. There's a really interesting Slate article from a mother who used to give a lot of thought to how to protect her kids from being scared by media, but then ended up with a three-year-old who adorably loves horror. She'll demand to listen to a CD of haunted house sounds while she reads. Not music, just sounds of chains rattling and people screaming. So cute. Kids developing a fascination with this stuff is pretty common, and it usually makes parents uncomfortable according to their anecdotes online. I have a nephew, he's five, and he watched some Chucky clips. He grabbed a knife and walked around with it, and when we asked him why he grabbed it, he said because Chucky does it. You really wanna be like Chucky, kid? That's your role model? What happened to kids looking up to John Wayne? They didn't need a knife, you know? They just grab a gun. Oh, that's not good. Parents are understandably conflicted about whether to encourage their kids' interest in horror. It's not like they want to just take all restrictions off and let the kids watch anything. There's always the chance of them going too far and really regretting it. After begging and begging to see scary stories to tell in the dark, my kid is traumatized and wants to leave the theater. I then downplayed the movie. It took months of reassurance that the monsters weren't real, how he's stronger than them. How if the monsters were real, then how we would use karate to beat them up, so on and so forth. Here's the deal, kid. You take the pale woman, throw her into Harold. Jangly man, you snap his neck, and you, they can also be stepped on. You also just can't really predict what's gonna get under a kid's skin. Our first child, when he was three, we used to watch Nightmare on Elm Street together, and he laughed and thought it was so funny because the bad guy got it in the end. On the other hand, Bambi had to be rapidly banned from our home because he woke up crying and crawling into our bed afterwards for two weeks. Oh, <laughs> Pussy! <laughs> I take that, I take that back. There are a lot of different routes you can go to let kids engage with horror safely. This person's parents would buy them horror movie action figures, but remove all the weapons. They had a Michael Myers with no knife that they would refer to as Nice Michael. We have had God knows how many Halloween movies, and they have yet to come up with one idea nearly as good as Nice Michael. And there are certainly those that take this all super seriously and think kids' viewing needs to be diligently policed. Look at the rating of the program your child wants to watch, and if it is anything other than G for general audience, then you say no and change the channel to something more appropriate. Dare to be the parent and not the friend. Yeah, dare to have your kids secretly watch it anyway at their friend's house and be too scared to talk to you about it because he was breaking your rules. How about you dare to fuck off? <laughs> oh my god. A three-year-old accidentally saw a scary movie? Well, that's just horrible. I'd go see a health specialist to see the best way of undoing what has been done due to this grave responsibility. As much as I once wished I had never seen Poltergeist, I'm over it now. As this parent says, there is no kid on the planet who has been permanently scarred by a horror film. Scared to sleep? That's fine, it'll pass. At the risk of discounting some people's experiences, it isn't really traumatizing to see a scene in a movie like that that even young kids know, deep down, is fake. In my own childhood, I never thought that a severed head was actually going to fly at my window. It was just my powerful kid imagination running away with an especially stimulating idea. But why were the scariest ideas I encountered as a kid the most stimulating? What was it about them? That's something I've always had trouble putting into words. There's a quote from a Slash Film article on the topic of children's horror that I really like. Being a kid is a scary thing. You have no control over your life, and you're deeply affected by parental concerns, like money troubles, job dissatisfaction, divorce, without being given a say-so in them. 
Kids are anxious and observant, and scary movies give them a safe place to frame that anxiety, to give it a name and face it through the brave young protagonists fighting monsters or witches or ghosts on screen. That's what I'm talking about with the real stakes, like the threat of death in a movie where death actually happens. Especially in kids' horror, where this scary thing, this new type of fear my child mind hasn't quite experienced before, is always overcome. Or maybe it's simply that I actually feel the threat, because horror is great at that. Protagonists winning in these kinds of intense stories against these kinds of chilling villains just feels more earned. But regardless of that, whether or not the protagonists even make it out, you make it out. And that can be empowering and exciting for a kid. As I exited childhood and entered high school, I definitely overcompensated for my former fear of adult horror movies. My friends and I watched tons of horror, from Texas Chainsaw Massacre to all the Saw movies, and not only Leprechaun, but Leprechaun 5, Leprechaun in the Hood. These days I've settled down a bit. I love a good scary movie or book, but I never find myself in the mood to binge the genre. It gets kind of exhausting. I think I enjoyed the adrenaline rush of being scared more when I was a kid than I do today. There's this adult emotion now when I'm thinking about horror, where I have to consider, my day was hard enough. Why should I put myself through this? It's the genre where I most don't know what I'm gonna get, or frankly, if I can handle it. But that bit of bravery can be really rewarding. I've never regretted watching a great horror movie, even if I end up with no intention of watching it again. Except Hereditary. I really didn't need to see that one. Oh my, this is pissing me off, I'm sorry. Slappy was doing it! Oh, <laughs> Slappy, what the hell, man? What's your problem? Oh, Slappy. Slappy, what in the heck are you doing, bud? What are you doing out here? What the heck? Slappy, you're gaming the fuck out? And I'm loving it? Slappy, what the heck are you cooking? Is that bug butternut squash soup? Let me get a lick of that. That's coming along great. Slappy, you're using it wrong, dude. Slappy, have you been taking my pills? Dude, that's a lot. That's too many. Oh my god, Slappy. Slappy, no! Slappy! Where did Slappy go? Oh my gosh, he's trying to eat my cereal. Get out of there, Slappy! Ugh. Oh, Hank's here? Hank's here? Slappy. Hank? Hank, Sla Hank Slappy. Hank? That's all for today, guys. Leave a like if you just love Slappy. And he just the cutest. <laughs> Are we in love?